Listen, John Wesley, John Wesley, they say if we uh, did inflation, you know, equalized out today, John Wesley could have probably been a millionaire in his day. He gave around, I think, around 250,000 Bibles away and all kinds of books to help people with, with growing, you know, in discipleship. But the whole point was he had a practice and he would not even allow people to worship without having an offering. That's pretty crazy because like, oh, another greedy pastor. <laughs> nope. He would stand at the door and he would offer the poor something to give because he thought that it was very, very important. He who offers thank offerings honors me and prepares the way for me to show him my salvation. And so he wanted to get everyone in the right mode to receive from the Lord by first bringing an offering to the Lord. And so he would give of his own wealth to the people coming in so that they could learn to give. And I'm telling you what, I have, I have seen it in my own life just starting. He says, give and it shall be given unto you. We're, he's already given to us. He says, tag your it. And so that's my little spill. We're going to receive our offering. It is a act of worship and it should be done joyously and joyfully for what God has done for us. So if you ushers want to come forward, we're going to go ahead and receive the offering and I am going to get going. Now, I'm going to tell you this. The sermon title for tonight is the perfect start for the new year. I didn't say the perfect sermon. I said a perfect start for the new year. <laughs> okay. I hope it'll be a good one. But uh, you guys are free to go. Thank you. So I want to start with a little story. I'm going to tell you, and I'm not ashamed of, I have talked about this subject in different times. And I'm telling you, um, I believe that it can be, and it is in my own life, just kind of like a thermometer to tell you your spiritual temperature. This is something that God says when you do this. He doesn't say if you do this. He says when you do this. And we're going to talk about it tonight. But I want to start with this little story. Listen to this. A bar that was trying to expand in Mount Vernon, Texas. Um, and as they're trying to expand, this local Baptist church started praying and doing what I'm talking about tonight. They didn't want their influence expanding, and so they started praying and fasting against this bar. Well, it wasn't too long till after that that lightning struck this bar, and the bar owner sued the church. Um, but the church vehemently denied all responsibility in the court of law. So the judge said this, he says, I don't know how I'm going to decide this case. It appears by the paperwork we have a bar owner who believes in the power of fasting and prayer and an entire congregation of the church that does not. <laughs> That's a weird place to be, right? They're like, we're praying and, and, and fasting, God, please. And then, boom, this thing goes up in flames and they say, well, it's not a, we have no responsibility of this. <laughs> Do you believe in the power of prayer? Do you believe in fasting? Not do you believe it intellectually. Do you believe it? So much that you're willing to say no to the flesh for a bigger purpose. Jesus said, when you fast, when you pray, when you give, not if you give or if you pray or if you fast, when, when you do it. Don't do it as a public show right? He says, if you do it before men to be seen by men, then you've got everything that you got coming to you right there. Congratulations. Some people saw you. If that's what you're doing it for, he says, your righteousness must exceed that of the Pharisees. What was the whole point? Well, they did everything for men to see. That's why Jesus was brutal with these people. He would call them snakes and all kinds of stuff in front of everybody else because he loved them and he wanted them to turn, but their whole life was in front of people. And so that's the last ditch effort before they go off the cliff to destruction. He's chicken necking these people in front of everyone because he says, listen, I'm humiliating you out of love because you do everything for men to see. You don't have authentic faith, selflessness. You're lustful. You're greedy. You got all these things, but you live your life for a performance. And I'm going to cut the roots of that or attempt to. So Religions do not agree on hardly anything, but they almost all teach fasting. Matter of fact, all of them that I know of outside of maybe Satanism, not for sure about if Satanism uh, does. But all the religions, they press 
fasting. Now listen to me. Muslims believe in the power of prayer and fasting. They do 40 days during Ramadan. Yet the enemy has stolen it from modern day American Christians. I don't care what you want to look at, the beautiful principles. If you want to look at family and what God ordained for family, and you see the Mormons, they really appreciate family. And they'll, they'll take that. They'll say, oh, we'll take that, man. We'll. The, the, uh, the Muslims, they look, oh, children are a blessing. Oh, man, we're going we're gonna to take over the world. And they take over countries just by birth rates alone. You look at the Jehovah Witnesses. They go, oh, the Christians are supposed to be out evangelizing. We'll take that one right there. Thank you very much. It frustrates me. When I drive by and I'm picking kids up for 20 years in buses and I see people on bicycles and I know they're not somebody from the local church. I know what they're doing. And it frustrates me that that's been stolen from, the end, from, from, from us and given to others. And so has this, this weapon. One researcher could not find a single Christian book published on fasting from 1861 to 1954. Almost a hundred years of silence on such an incredible subject. Why? Because Satan doesn't want us using this incredibly powerful tool. Listen to this. A church historian, Tertullian, who watched the apostles said that they fasted often and they used it as a weapon to drive out the fiercest of demons. Like spirits of confusion that would plague a land that young people could stand in front of a mirror and not even decide what gender they are. That's some of the fiercer demons, right? There's never been a generation in the history of the world in such confusion as we have today. We've got spirit of, of suicide. Thousands and thousands of young people ending their life right as their life should be bursting forth with all the joy and pleasures of everything that God has for them and they're deciding to end their life. Those are fierce demons. Opiate overdoses and all the craziness that's attacking all the spiritual forces that are going on. And if the church is just sitting by and we're not using the weapons that God, he says they're mighty. Listen to this. The gifts that he gives us and the things that he gives us, they are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. He says, we're not here with a little water gun. We're here with a bazooka. We're here with mighty weapons, right? For the pulling down of strongholds. So this generation, well, let me go back because I'm not done with the saying here. Listen, he says, he watched the apostles. He said they fasted often and they used it as a weapon to drive out the fiercest of demons. But he says, I think it's interesting that they use the same method to both drive out the evil spirits, listen carefully, and to invite the Holy Spirit. When they had a problem, they would fast to drive out the demons. Then they would fast that the Holy Spirit could indwell them in new and powerful ways and complete ways. So this generation has almost completely and purposely forgotten this means of grace that is so often spoken of in scripture and practiced by committed Christians down through the ages. John Wesley said, some have exalted religious fasting beyond all scripture and reason. You know, there's always those zealots that say, hey, if God says this, then let's take it to here. He said, that's not what I'm talking about says there's others have other utterly disregarded it and we live among the latter group john wesley encouraged his people to fast two days a week and would not ordain anyone who would not do it he obviously believed in it <laughs> pretty seriously said oh you want a pastor oh you're not willing to fast a couple days a week mm -hmm. you're mm -hmm. whether that's correct or not you can see that he was dead serious about what he believed John Wesley was simply one among many who fasted and testified of his power. John Calvin, John Knox, Jonathan Edwards, Martin Luther, David Brainerd, Charles Finney, just to name a few. Peter did it. Paul did it for seven days, 10 days, 14 days. We've got, we've got all kinds of examples in scripture of him doing it. Moses, the one who knew God face to face. Listen to this. He fasted twice in the presence of God for 40 days, twice. David, the man after God's own heart, fasted for a week. We know that. Elijah, the one who called the entire nation back to God, did it for 40 days. Hannah, the one who was sick of being barren. Anybody sick of being barren spiritually? Have you been in a church the whole, your whole life and you've never had the joy of winning someone to the Lord? I remember the first time that I got the privilege to pray with some, someone and they accepted the Lord. 
repented of their sins and put their faith in God. I came home and I was like, mom, I just made more money than the entire world. <laughs> she was like, what are you talking about? I was like, I just led somebody to the Lord. The first time I remember doing that, it was overwhelming joy, overwhelming joy. And if you're like some of the women of all that say, I want some babies. And you start crying and weeping and saying, God, I got to extend this praise out beyond me. I got to find some younger people. I got to find some other people that I can pass this torch down to, right? So when I'm dead and gone, they will be holding the torch. So Esther, the one who saved her nation from destruction, fasted. Daniel, the one who changed the hearts of four kings. Anna, the one who was waiting for and saw and held the Messiah, our salvation. She had her eyes opened because she wasn't living by the sensual, by just her eyes and ears and nose and mouth and, you know, feeling here physically, but she had her spiritual eyes open. And it's kind of like when someone is blind, they get their, their senses start coming alive in other ways. Talk about that in a minute. Paul, the one who brought the gospel to the Gentiles, he fasted. Jesus, the one who constantly lives to make intercession for us. Jesus did it for 40 days. It says, after 40 days, Jesus was hungry. Now, I used to think that was the most duh statement in the entire Bible. You know, like, mm, you think? But then it hit me. I wonder if God's saying, listen, no, he was authentically hungry after 40 days. Why? Because many of the times that we eat, we're doing it for emotional support. I mean, how many of you guys, could you testify that? I mean, I've been to the refrigerator so many times because I'm feeling lonely or this or that or whatever. I'm like, why am I eating right now? I don't know, but it just feels better. Why? Jesus didn't have all that. He was secure in his father, right? He goes out and he's fasting in the wilderness for 40 days with the wild animals and all the demonic. And it says after 40 days, he hungered. Man, he was hungry. How many times are we not hungry? I mean, I just tell you, some of, some of the, I think way more about food many times when I'm not fasting than when I am fasting. Because this goes and it's like my mind is on greater things. And it can, it, it, it can be powerful, and it is. So, Satan used food to tempt the first Adam. He ate and dominion was lost. Because he ate when he wasn't supposed to. He ate what he was not supposed to. Think with me. He used the same to tempt the last Adam, and he didn't eat, and dominion was won. Jenison Franklin says this, Adam and Eve literally ate themselves out of the garden. <laughs> That's how they got out. They couldn't control those desires. So let me just give you a quick outline of what fasting is. It can be many different things, but normally when we say fasting, we're talking about refraining from food or pleasurable things in a physical realm for a spiritual purpose and power. It's not fasting gossip. That's stopping sinning. Fasting is giving up something that is good that God gives you and you give it up for a time. And there's all kinds of different ways to do it. But things that are good you give them up for a higher purpose. That would be what fasting is, okay? So a normal fast would just be not eating and just drinking water, whether you do it for a meal or whether you do it for 40 days. An absolute fast would be no water and no food, right? A Daniel fast or a partial fast would maybe where you fast sugar or you're going without eating anything pleasurable. That can be challenging, right? Because every time you want to go get something good, you're like, hmm. Lord, you're where I find my joy. You know, we were singing, I can't remember, in Christ alone or something this morning. I was thinking, do I find all of my wisdom from him or am I leaning on myself? Do I find all of my joy in him? Do I find all of my pleasure in him? Does it mean that God doesn't bring different people to you? You find pleasure, but you realize that they came from him. If they're, if they're good gifts, they came from him. And so everything goes back. Every good and perfect gift goes back to him. So in him, you can find everything that you need. Everything. So I told you, um, well, let me just go here for quickly. It says that Daniel, he ate no desirable food. 
for 21 days. And you guys know there was massive war going on in the heavenlies because Satan did not want us to know what God was going to reveal to Daniel that he was going to reveal to the world through his word. He did not want the world to know that. So there's this massive war going on and Daniel is fasting. He's giving up. Remember what he did at the beginning. He goes for 10 days. He's eating vegetables and drinking water. And every day he's getting, he's getting the wisdom just compounded. Bang, bang, bang. 10 days, he gets 10 times the wisdom. 10 times the wisdom. There are supernatural spiritual things. And if you don't have the vision, you're never going to give up the pleasurable in the beginning to get his presence and power coming to your life the way that God wants to give it to you. But with a vision, you're not going to perish and your family doesn't have to perish because you're willing to make the short-term sacrifices or what they really are, are investments, right? To have his presence and his power in your life in powerful and tangible ways so that you can see his kingdom moving forward. So when the angel comes to him, listen, it says, Daniel, greatly beloved. And I've shared this with you before, but listen to this. Great beloved, it's the same exact word in the original language for greatly desired. He's saying, the angel comes and says, you are greatly desired by God. And he sees that you've been giving up the desirable food that your taste buds would like and you're ba- you're be booing backflips on the inside if you ate, but you gave up those desirable things that you actually wanted. You know your favorite thing. It's different for you and different for me. But what you want and you say no, so you say yes to him on a whole new level for a period of time. And God says, I'm noticing this. I see this and you're greatly desirable to me because you're giving up those desirable things. And not that you're growing, that God's love is growing for you, but I'm telling you what, you can become more favorable and more desirable in a sense. God says, I see, I see what you're doing. And it makes my heart long to be intimate with you as well. So I told you, it says in scripture, not if you fast, but when you fast, Jesus says this, when the bridegroom is gone, they will fast. They will fast. There's an expectation by Jesus that if you're a disciple, then it means discipline one. You're disciplined. You're not being ruled by the flesh. You're being ruled by the spirit. So if the spirit is ruling, he says, you're my disciple if you're one of my disciplined ones. But how do you get disciplined? You work it up on your own? No. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit, right? It's one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit, self-control. It's just when love is dominating you, right? And controlling you. I don't know if dominate's the right word, but it's controlling you through his love. And so he says, I could. Yes, my body wants that, but I I want something greater. There's something right now that I've been saying no to a whole bunch of stuff because I want to see God say yes. I want to see marriage happen. I want to see blessing and favor. And there's multiple things. You know what I know? I don't want to enter this new year and get through this new year I'll tell you, last Sunday, I'm not going to tell you all the circumstances, but I promise you I'm not exaggerating, okay, from crazy demonic things in three different settings just last Sunday that I was dealing with. And I said, God, if you don't give me more power and authority through purity, I don't know how I can face the rest of this year. It was crazy land just on Sunday. Three different situations where cops are involved and people are running naked and all kinds of crazy stuff. You're like, what is going on? But I know that we need power and authority. And when Jesus walks up and he sees this demoniac with 2,000 demons in him, running naked, breaking every chain, terrifying everyone, you see him what? Sitting there clothed and in his right mind. And he becomes such a testimony of God's grace and his power. How did that happen? Jesus, no sooner than his father gives him this blessing, you're my son. You're my dear, precious son. I love you. You're not in trouble. I'm not punishing you, but here's where I'm going to lead you by my spirit out into the wilderness. Guess what? To fast. Why? What did I do wrong? No, you're going to be led there by the spirit, but you're going to come out, listen to this, in the power of the spirit. In the power of the spirit, you're going coming out different than you went in. And that's what happens in a fast. I'm going to challenge every single one of us to go. From, we have transformed in three weeks from Friday, so this would be the end of our transformed day, 21 days from now. And I'm gonna challenge each person to ask God, what do you want me to give up so I can be part of other men's freedom? 
other men's freedom, marriage is healed, addictions broken, demonic activity gone, all the different things that God is wanting to do in men's lives that he's going to draw there and to say, listen, will you come alongside? Maybe you're praying for your own family. Get a mission that's bigger than that little thing you want to eat or that little thing you want to watch or whatever it is that you want to do and give up, say, I'm going to give up some of my sleep. I'm going to, I'm going to set my alarm 30 minutes earlier. And for the next 21 days, I'm going to fast that 30 minutes of sleep and I'm going to invest it into my king. Whatever it is, you can say, well, no, I can't, I can't fast. Everybody can fast. What do you like? If it doesn't mean anything to you, it's not going to mean anything to God. But if it means something to you and it gets your attention, I'm going to tell you something. I, I tell you guys, I promise you I can get your attention really quickly and I can get you in tune with the Lord. You start giving up a few things and I can start naming them bang, bang, bang. And for most men, they're like, mm, get your attention, right? Food being one of them. Food being one of them. You know, when the dog whisperer says, when you have a, when there's a new pack leader, it's very simple. He says, when I can walk up and take the dish away from the dog anytime, like I try to, my son's dog, I think he's going to rip my arm off. So, I'm like, oh, I'm just going <laughs> to let him have this. But when God can come up and say, son, no, no, that's good. Right? You're like, yeah, whenever. That'll get your attention. And he says, when the dog, when the, when the owner is over the mating of a dog, then he's the, he's the new pack leader. Hey, all right, no food. Nope. This is a couple of examples, but I'm telling you when, when God starts, you start giving up different areas. You know what happens? Your spiritual eyes start being opened. Your ears become very clear. Your hard heart can become very soft. Your will can be broken for the things of God. And you can get a vision like you've never had. And you can start seeing power in your life like you've never seen maybe before. So I'm preaching better than you guys are amening. But anyways, okay, here we go. If you are his follower, he says what? You will fast. And now is the time. He says, according to him, when the bridegroom is not here, he goes away. My bride will fast. It's like, well, he must be talking about us. So it's every Christian's calling and every disciple's duty. Fasting isn't just for the extraordinary Christian. It is for every ordinary Christian. But it does lead to the extraordinary. It is the source of secret supernatural vision, wisdom, power, and favor. Told you how Daniel literally, he put away this food for 10 days with great wisdom. And what did God do? He, he literally just multiplied his wisdom over and over and over. Toxins are literally being expelled out of your body 10 times as fast when you are going on a complete fast. It's incredible. And I think as, you know, just a matter of being able to see it in your urine that, whoa, something's happening. Things are happening in my body. And at the same time, you can see that your spiritual eyes are being opened and your ears are being, being opened and you're hearing and this stubborn will is being broken and all of these different things can happen at that very time. You can have 10 times the strength or a hundred times the strength or a thousand times the strength. It is the almighty God has unlimited power for us, unlimited power. Pretty wild because when I was over in Israel, they were the, uh, our guide was talking about the 1967 war and how they were attacked right when the enemy thought they would be the weakest. They attacked them right at the end of a three-day fast. Like, they're going to be weak. They're going to be weak. <laughs> I don't want to state this wrong, but I remember it was one or the other. It was either one man for every, I think it was one man, every uh, Jewish man in the, in the battle for every hundred there was from the enemy. And one, they had one tank for every 40. And I believe that was the way it was. If it wasn't, it was reversed. But they had, they were massively outnumbered. And it was one to 40 and one to 100. And God gave them the victory, boom, because they were the strongest. They weren't the weakest. They had been fasting. And God came and delivered them very, very quickly because I believe this was part of the equation. The enemy thought, oh, he's going to be the weakest. No, not spiritually, not spiritually at all. So Jesus spent 40 days out in there, out in the wilderness. And what does it say? 
that he came out different than he went in. He knew there were things that he could only do through prayer and fasting. Do you remember the, the father who came with a demon-possessed son and he falls before Jesus and he's been talking to the, to the disciples and they've been casting out demons and doing all this stuff before. So he's like, I've come to your disciples and they can't do anything. My son, he's, a, he's got a deaf and mute spirit. And I think the church has that. If we don't hear God like Samuel heard God, we cannot speak the way that Samuel spoke. Our words fall to the ground and we just, like salt, we just get ran over by our culture. Like, oh, here the... But when you speak because you hear from God and you're not a deaf and mute spirit, it starts with deafness. You don't hear God's voice that spoke the universe into being. One of the big things that God's hit me with is transformed is in the beginning was the word. The word of God is the beginning of everything, right? And it says, God said the word of God, the living word of God spoke the written word of God, right? And he speaks and says, let there be light. And when God's word comes to you and in the beginning of whatever venture God has for you, his word comes to you as a seed and you say, let there be light, right? That's the cry of your heart. And he says, yeah, I say, let there be light in you. And all of a sudden that vision comes alive and you can hold to it because you have light now. You know what that man, that man that was saved like I was talking about in the water, He's literally everything he had, light sticks, try to do this, whistles, nothing. Everything was broken and messed up and wouldn't work, but he had one flashlight and he could, that's how he was saved. Bunch of drunks, couple drunks, saw just one flicker of his light, one point. And all you need is just that ray of hope, right? That ray of light that God speaks to you and that you can hold to. And so all the circumstances can die, null and void, boom. It does not matter because God has spoken. He has spoken to the darkness. And all of a sudden, now you can cling to it. So, thank you, Andrew. <laughs> so demon, this demon, this spirit of suicide that's throwing this young man in the fire and all this kind of stuff. It says this. It says, this kind only comes out by prayer and fasting. This kind. I don't think the spirit of confusion in our generation is just going to leave because we wishy, wishy, we, we, you know, and have a, another potluck. That's not what's going to happen. There's going to have to be some sacrifice. There's going to have to be some prayer and there's going to have to be some fasting. You're going to see people with some vision and some investment of pleasures that God says they're serious. They're serious. I'm serious. So as this man literally comes and kneels before Jesus, Jesus just speaks, boom, and this demon is gone. Why? Because Jesus spent the 40 days out there and he was empowered by the Spirit. He was empowered by the Spirit. He had paid the price. What chains are not being broken because you can't give up your Cheetos or I can't give up mine? What are we, how are we an ep and an impotent because we've just given into the God, the God of comfort and all of these types of things. What besetting sin is you become repetitive slaves of habitual sinful behaviors or attitudes. It says one place in scripture that Satan has taken them captive to do his will. There are more men in most American churches that have looked at porn that week than pay their tithe. They are slaves to besetting sins and they cannot seem to release it. But you get a man that will say no to this and just say, God, will you please help me? And God can free that man and free that family. He and his whole household, so many times in scripture, he and his whole household. And it's pretty wild, I've mentioned this before, but whatever this does for your theology, Think with me for a moment, because the whole Passover lamb, one father would come and he would offer that sacrifice for his entire family. That lamb was for his entire family. That's at least a picture of what God is desiring, that men would come and walk in freedom and that their whole family would experience the grace of God in their lives. So fasting isn't fun, but it is fantastically fruitful. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to live this year with last year's power. I wanna live with new authority and new power spiritually, but we have grown comfortable, listen to this, and complacent with a system of beliefs many times 
rather than total transformation. Did you hear what I said? We can grow comfortable with a system of beliefs. Like we got all of our ducks in a row. Yes, Jesus died, this, dun, 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 dun. you got all the theology, but do you have power? Do we have power in our lives to say no to selfishness and to live selflessly so that God's power can flow through us to others? That's what God is desiring. Hunger can drive you when nothing else will work. You know what God says? For a lazy man, if he's lazy, there's one thing that works for him. You know what it is? He gets hungry. God says if he's not willing to work, he shouldn't eat. Well, it's like, well, that's unkind, God. We should feed. No, he says, no, if he's not willing to work, he doesn't eat. I'm betting this lazy guy is probably going to decide he probably wants to do at least enough to feed his belly, right? Because it gets to a point where those desires overcome your laziness and can help start bumping you to move in the right direction. He says, hunger is a powerful, powerful thing. And when you hunger physically on purpose, it can ignite a spiritual passion and a spiritual hunger. And God does not ever want to leave us hungry. So, Hunger may be your greatest resource and the path to true blessing. Listen to the scripture verse, Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. For they will be filled. Think about what drove the prodigal son home. What drove him home? He just missed Papa. You know what drove him home? He's looking at what the pigs are eating and he says, how many of my father's house, servants, not sons, servants, have food to spare? They're eating like kings. And here I am desiring slop. I should go home and tell my dad, dad, I know I can't be a son maybe, but I could be a servant. And his dad won't have any of it, right? He sees him from afar off and just sees the repentance in his heart, even though it was most likely out of out of self-preservation and, and physical hunger, but his father saw him from a long way off and he ran to him and fell on him and started kissing him and said, you're my son, you're my son. But it was hunger that drove him home. So heaven's portion for you is most likely determined by your appetite, by your appetite. What do you want? What do you want? Young people, what do you want in your life? Do you want to be used by God? Do you want to be a change element to a, to a culture that has no idea why they're here, how to treat one another, what life is about, where to find true joy, happiness, fulfillment, purpose? They don't know. They're completely lost. So we get to 14, 15, 16. They've burned every single pleasurable thing. They've snorted it, taken it, shot it up, done it. They, and they're, they're empty. And they have nothing. They have nothing. But we have the answer. We have the answer. So what if I told you that fasting is the key to blessing, prosperity, anointing, and satisfaction? Listen to what God says in Joel 2. This is verses 12 through 14a. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart and with fasting and weeping and mourning and rend your heart and not your garments. Now return to Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and relenting of evil, who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave, listen to this, a blessing behind him. God was coming at this point for judgment. And he says, let's repent. Let's mourn over our sin and let's add giving up food for a time. And that may get God's attention right? In a special way. And who knows, not only will he maybe forgive us, but he will actually could leave behind a blessing. Like getting pulled over by the cops and the cops saying, you know what? I'm not going to give you a ticket. Matter of fact, I'm going to give you this hundred dollar bill. It's like, don't deserve that. <laughs> right? But he says, that's what God wants. That's his heart. That's his heart. Mercy is not getting what we do deserve. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. And that's what God wants to do. He is gracious. That's how he describes himself. So let me ask you, what are you truly hunger for? Hungry for? Meaning? Purpose? Belonging? Identity? 
I remember a lot of my carnal desires that were so inflamed and so ultimately just crippling nearly to me was a lack of identity in Christ, a lack of true belonging in him, finding my security in him, finding my peace in him, and learning to rest in him. I was just talking to Michaela before, and he was just talking about how the Jewish nation, it was so, such a cool idea that I never even thought about before in this way, but it was in the evening and the morning was the first day. So God teaches his people to start the day by resting. Isn't that cool? And then God creates Adam on day six, and the very first full day is a day of rest. He says, go take over the whole world, take dominion, but start by having a siesta, right? Sit down and rest before you take over the whole world. So you're coming from a place of rest. You're reigning and ruling from a place of rest. You're not working to get to rest. That's awesome. That only happens through, as we were talking, through dependence. And I think that if there's one thing that I would say right now, God is working me over, it's getting to a place of rest. Rest and my spirit. So, are you hungry for approval, applause, love? Some of you guys are being manipulated by the enemy because you, th you believe lies about this is what's going to make me feel loved. If I achieve more or get more, then I'll know who I am because I made this much or I was sought after by this guy or I had this experience or whatever it is. It's like, no, you got to find it in Jesus. Are you hungry for community? To be known? Are you hungry for his righteousness, his kingdom, and his presence? Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness and says, all these things will be added unto you, all of them. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Psalms 42, verses 1 and 2a. Do you long for him? Do you thirst for him? Hunger for him? I've told people, you know, I can, having done jujitsu for years, you can realize that air that people take for granted becomes very important to them and blood running to people's heads is, off, is pretty important as well. And you don't, you don't appreciate it until it's taken away from you, right? But I have watched people go from just nice, friendly people to raging, <laughs> crazy people just because you take a little air from them, right? Just for a few seconds. But you know what you could do? You can take where you're breathing and just bring it down to like a McDonald's straw or a Burger King straw or whatever, and then maybe take it down from there to like a coffee straw and just put a, a, a clothespin on your nose and tape just around that straw. All of a sudden, this becomes very important to you. Oxygen becomes very important. And when you say, I'm going to take away that pleasure, I'm going to take away this pleasure, I'm going to take it. God says he gives all things richly to enjoy. So it would be a sin if God gave us marital intimacy and food and we're like, I'm eating with my, because I don't like to taste stuff. No, that would be a sin. He says, you sh he's given you this richly to enjoy. But when we take those pleasures and different things that may be important to us and we put them to a side for a purpose, for a period of time in a righteous way, you know what happens? Our desires they move up, at least in my life, for spiritual things. And I start getting very, very serious very, very quickly. And it is a catalyst to help me. And I think it's a catalyst in all of our lives. That's why this is, the enemy works so hard to keep us just constantly what? Pleasuring ourselves. Constantly. And you know what happens? We become the church of Laodicea. They had homes of a thousand square feet and running water. And because of those two things, most people were living in homes about 600 square feet and they had to go carry their water. But the Laodiceans, all they had, this, they were connected to this little river, basically where they had uh, like PVC pipes, not PVC, but they would do it through um, little bamboo. 
things cut in half, right? And things, and they would just funnel it right in their house and right on down. So they could go over and literally have running water in their home. And they're like, what do you need? We're good. We don't need anything. We got all of these comforts and different things in life. And they became complacent to the Lord. And he says, you're actually blind, you're naked, you're destitute, and you don't see any, you don't even have a desire for the things of God because these comforts have numbed you to the reality of who you really are spiritually. Is anybody hearing me? I guess not. Huh? So what are things that affect your appetite? Eating junk. Eating junk will affect your appetite. Not training your appetite. Listen to this. Ephraim feeds on wind and pursues the east wind continually. He multiplies lies and violence. Moreover, he makes a covenant with Assyria and oil is carried to Egypt. That's Hosea 12.1. Okay, I want to read the last portion of it again. He makes a covenant with Assyria or contract with Netflix or whatever it is. I don't know what it is. But he, they go, hey, you know, I come home every night and binge want to this and I'm just numb that my relationship with God isn't where it's supposed to be and that my neighbor's going to hell and this and this and that. I, I'm just... I'm just entertaining myself. I'm being detained until something maybe can enter me, a spirit of complacency. And I sit here and I make this covenant with them and I pay them 29 bucks or whatever it is a month and I just get to watch endless stuff and can waste my time or whatever. But he says, but the problem is, and the oil is carried to Egypt. Well, Egypt is where God took us from. The oil represents the spirit of God. So now all of a sudden, the power of God is not in our life. It's gone to Egypt. And we've just made this contract with, it's very easy today. And you just realize that I'm just living for a life of comfort right now. And my life is being stolen from me day by day. And I'm not living by anything greater than what his, for his purposes. I'm just living for my comforts. What power is missing from our church? What power is missing from our lives? Your life, my life. Psalm 79 says, The men of Ephraim, though armed with bows, turn back on the day of battle. These were the same guys. Ephraim feeds on wind. They keep thinking, I'm going to be satisfied if I can get this little bit of wind and this. And he's like, you're running after foolishness. You can't pleasure yourself enough to be satisfied. It's impossible. The reason you want to watch another movie is because the last one didn't satisfy you, right? But he says, he's the God who satisfies us. That's beautiful. And so... Ephraim is armed with these great and mighty weapons. They got air, bows and arrows and all this kind of stuff. But they see the enemy and they tuck tail and they run because the oil's been sent back to Egypt. So let me just end this with just sharing a few personal things here. New dreams and visions. New dreams and visions. And I would say also direction told you guys last time I went over to spend three days with the Lord I didn't even get to my room till somebody came out and met me and said you want to come in here 34 pastors are in here praying and they spoke over me within minutes and let me know that God says I see you I see what you're doing and I'm going to speak over you and I had a guy literally tell me things about me that there's no way he knew outside of the Holy Spirit I never met this man in my life and he literally read my mail and then three different times told me, now is the time. Now is the time. We leave that, that weekend. Somebody walks up and gives me a $5,000 check. Somebody else comes up and says, God's calling me to start a business to support this ministry. One thing that this guy said is God is now supporting this ministry. God is taking the bill. Somebody came up and gave me a brand new cover trailer for Transformed, right? And exactly what this guy prophesied over me started happening. But it was in a time of fasting and praying and getting rid of everything else and just focusing 100% on the Lord. And God sees and he honors those. He honors those. And he'll do the same. I mean, I, it's, it's crazy. One of the families that's just been coming here for a few, a few months, my little daughter, this is just an example, but I'm going to go ahead and share the testimony. My little daughter, Haven, or Zoe, she's been begging me for a pony. And I'm like, yeah, over my dead body type of thing, you know? But she's been begging me and begging me. And I keep driving home and she's riding the dog. I got pictures on my phone. You want to come see it? She's riding the dog, right? And she comes in two weeks before Christmas and she says, Daddy, 
She changes from asking me to telling me what she's doing. She's saying, I'm praying for a pony. I said, oh, really? What color is it? She says, it's black and white. I want a black and white pony, and I want a cart behind it. <laughs> My dad just say, wishes in one hand, horse manure in the other. Which one do you think is going to add up first? <laughs> but I'm thinking, oh, great. She's four years old, and she's telling me what she wants, and that she's praying for this. I don't know what to do. So I just got my camera. I said, what color is your brain? Your orange and green? She said, no, black and white. I'm praying for a black and white pony. Like a week and a half later or something, lady calls us and says, Bree, you got to, you got to, don't text me. Call me back. Call me back. So she calls her back and she says, this is crazy. She says, my daughter, she feels like she just heard from the Lord. She goes, she went to bed last night, felt like she heard from the Lord for the first time in her life. And she wants to be obedient. She said that she, in this dream, she's walking down you guys' driveway and she felt a God impressed on her that she's supposed to give one of her ponies, she had two ponies, one of her ponies to Zoe. What? She's like, oh, and the horse has been trained with these, this little cart, you know? And we may have this Amish made cart and it's just sitting on our front porch. And the pony, the second pony is the, I don't know, the baby, the pony of this other pony, right? And so... She said, it's not going to be trained for years to, to run this thing. So we would just like to bring it over to your house so that she can have this cart to be with this black and white little pony. If I was going to put this in a sermon, I would have thrown the pictures up there. It's crazy. It's crazy. But it's just one more little story of just God just affirming. It's just a pony, but it's not just a pony. It's God saying, seek my kingdom first. And all these things will be added unto you. It's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. So, the new anointing, new dreams and new visions. I told you guys before, TMMA was birthed out of a womb of fasting. Not feasting, but fasting. When one sense is lost, another takes his place. A blind person's hearing is elevated when their eyes are taken away. When you don't live sensually, but you live spiritually by faith, your ears start becoming open, right? Some blind people can walk into a room and just from the sounds, they can tell you, okay, there's a picture over here. The room is 12 by 14. There's a couch right here. They can tell you the layout of the room by what they hear. The sound waves bouncing off of things and they can tell you and they can navigate with no eyes. How in the world do you do that? You take away one sense and the other senses become elevated, right? Many theologians believe that we were, when we were in the garden, and I believe it too, that we have, John Wesley believed we had five physical senses and five spiritual senses. Taste and see that the Lord is good. My sheep hear my voice, right? All these kind of things. If the shepherd doesn't touch the lambs, you know what? That's the, because they don't touch the lambs on a daily basis, they stop listening to the shepherd. So there's a sense of feel. Have you felt God touch your heart recently? You need to be touched every single day by the Lord. He needs to lay his hand on you and touch you. You need to hear his voice. You need to sense his goodness and his provision in your life. You need to taste of him and you need to see that he is good. Those are all spiritual things that happen, right? When you are born again, those spiritual, those spiritual senses come alive, but they can wane. And just like my wife, at different times, I've been very, very in tune to what my wife is saying. Other times, now, you know, sometimes I have to cry by the face and say, honey. <laughs> we can, even the one that we love, we can kind of grow cold to, right? And we kind of can tune them out. So, fasting is about your future and the future of others. New anointing is what can happen. Listen to this. Mark 22, chapter 2, verse 20. Jesus says to his disciples, we'll fast. And then two verses later, listen to what he said. He, he talks of new wine. After coming off the 40-day fast, Jesus begins healing. It says, all those who were oppressed of the devil. That's what it says about him. He came out of the desert. And he starts healing all those who were oppressed of the devil. He has not just a spiritual power in him, but it's exterior. He's going out and he's affecting everyone around him once he's willing to go into the desert. So 
Most put their desires above their divine destiny and others' deliverance, unfortunately. Jesus, whenever his disciples are saying, Jesus, I have food here, he says, I have food you know not of. My food is what? To do the will of my Father. I know this, that one point of just fasting was my conception point of my calling. It was the birthplace of a supernatural blessing and the anointing for my assignment. It is also a powerful catalyst for God to shape your character and to give you vision, vision. New blessings. Fasting opens the windows of heaven and slams shut the gates of hell. Remember Jehoshaphat? The first thing when the three armies, the world, the flesh, and the devil are coming against you, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life are coming against you, and you realize, I'm going to lose, I'm going to lose, I'm going to lose. Fast. Pray. Cry out to God. I don't, know how to, I don't know how to defeat this, Lord. These temptations are so great. They're overwhelming. They're overwhelming to my children in this day. You start fasting and praying. What happens? God says, this battle's not your battle. It's my battle. I'm going to take it up. You're going to get to see and then for three days, you're just going to go and collect all the treasures from my victory because you're willing to fast and pray. After the Civil War, America was in shambles. Poverty was everywhere. Abraham Lincoln led the nation in a four separate fast to heal the nation. Listen to this. The next year, in 1867, Russia sold Alaska for $7.2 million. That was 0.2 cents. I'm sorry, two cents per acre. Two cents per acre is what we got it for. That was a blessing from God. New inventions started coming. The phonograph, the electric light, the airplane, the telegraph. We captured the motor in the car industry. The federal government had a surplus for four years, for over 25 years, sorry. That's a miracle right there. The government had a surplus for 25 years after he led the nation. And let's humble ourselves and let's fast and pray for our nation. Man, I wish we could do that again. Atlanta, which had been burnt to the ground, Coca-Cola made their headquarters there. God can bless anything and anyone if we're willing to do what he says. New victories. Christ hungered so you could be filled. He thirsted so you could drink from the rivers of life. Do you remember the story of David? He's in this cave and he says, Oh, how I wish somebody would get me a drink from the well of the gate of Bethlehem. He just makes this statement. And these three warriors, if I remember the story correctly, these guys go out and they fight through Philistine ranks and armies, the army, to go and get him a little cup of water from Bethlehem. And God hears the cry of your heart. And when you give up physical pleasures or physical things, and you say, oh, how I long for my marriage to be healed. How I long for your presence to be in my life. How I long for a legacy of righteousness to travel down through my children. How I long to see God working in this nation. And you just breathe those little prayers up to God. He hears them and he fought. He fought literally through all the demonic realm, descended down into hell, right? Got the keys to death, hell, and the grave and brought it back and says, here, if you'll follow me, I'll give you life-giving streams of water flowing out of your belly. Just say no to a few things. It can be such a powerful thing. Such a powerful thing. So, I really am ending here. There are two different kinds of high jump competitions in the Olympics. The high jumpers on their own can jump around seven feet in the air. That's incredibly impressive. But there's another kind of high jumpers. They're called pole vaulters. They jump... You been how high? Around three times as high, close to 20 feet in the air. I just see that as a picture of prayer. And he says, you want supercharged? Add fasting to that. It would terrify me. I, I can never imagine going over to Transformed without fasting and inviting a whole bunch of other people, anybody that will fast and pray with us to pray. Because I've been wired to see things happen. You know, some people will just think, I want to see things happen. And I feel like that's what God has birthed in me, that desire. And it, the, from, from learning, praying for 15 years, God teach my hands to war. How do we break men free? And then seeing how demonic, you know, things can get 
when one man comes free and those spirits jump to other men and start affecting all kinds of crazy things and all this kind of stuff. We need power and authority. Every single man, I have seen our family attacked. I've seen multiple people that come alongside us attacked. I've seen all kinds of crazy things. The point is, when you're going into times of battle like that, it's very, very important that you have support and you have people that are giving up a little something for massive things to happen on the other side. Fasting is like throwing gasoline on a liquor, little flicker in your soul. It's like hitting the nitro button in a race car. You can just pull all your forward. I want to end with just this one last story, and that is Elisha. If you remember the armies, Arameans, I believe it was, surrounding Samaria, and they had gotten to a point where literally, I mean, there's crazy stuff going on. Moms are saying, hey, I'll I tell you what, let's, let's eat our babies. I don't know. We're going to die. Although we're all going to die. Let's eat our children. And so they start, he said, um, let's eat yours today and tomorrow we'll eat mine. And so one of the moms says, okay. And she agrees to it and they eat the child. And then the next day, the mom has hidden the child. And this mother is, this other lady is wailing and going to the king. The king's like, we're going to go get Elisha because they're all here for Elisha. Remember, there's these four lepers that are sitting out there. And they say, if we go into the city, there's nothing to eat in there. They're eating donkey heads. They're eating dove dung. They're paying crazy silver money for dove dung. And they're eating seed pods. That's what they got in there. We're going to go in there and we're going to die. If we sit here, we're going to die. But if we go over there, there's a chance that they would have mercy on us and that we could live. I don't know. But I look at our culture and I say, if we sit here idle anymore, we can't afford to just sit here. We can't afford it. There's 50 million children basically in America that are being trained in absolute demonic things and we have the chance to be a light and a testimony to them i know i'm talking about big things tonight but i believe that god hears and he sees and when we're willing to just make the smallest of sacrifice he said if you had any idea any idea it'd be like giving a dollar i tell the kids this all the time if i gave you a dollar and you could understand that if you do something with this dollar tonight it's attached to a million dollars tomorrow if you go out and you take this and invest it in someone that's needy instead of going buy yourself a candy bar, I believe that's, that's kind of what we're seeing is that we can make the smallest little things. Like so many times I brought my, my wife just some simple little thing, not so many times, the few times that I've brought my wife something so small and I see and she's like, oh, honey, I'm like, I'm an idiot. How easy is this? And I still can't pull it off, you know? And it's like, God, just look, just give me something. I remember so many times I've gone to the, 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 the cupboards or something to get just some piece of candy or something. And, he, and I have a, literally a spiritual meltdown because he's like, son, give that up for this. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. You guys, anybody ever <laughs> experienced that? And I just say, am I literally that self-centered that I'm struggling with this one thing that I'm getting ready to put in my mouth? And God says, no, give me that. I've had it happen to me numerous times. Just give me that. Say no for this. And I've seen God work miraculously at the simplest of sacrifices or investments. So I want you to bow your head with me. I want to encourage you to just ask the Lord, Lord, do you want me to join? If you call this your church and this is your group of people that you fellowship, I am asking and begging you to participate over the next 21 days and just ask the Lord, Lord, what would you like for me to give up, not stop sinning somewhere, but what is something good that you have given me that I can say I'm giving back to you for this season for a bigger purpose? Will you lay your finger on it and will you anoint me? Will you draw me closer to you? Will you increase my territory? Will you increase our territory as a body of believers? Will you bless us so that we can be a blessing to others? 
Can we become more desirable to you because we give up a little simple desirable thing here in the short term? God, I'm asking you that you will speak to each and every one of us, that you'll give us the courage and the strength to follow through. I pray we won't make a big deal about it, throw a pity party for ourselves, but you love a cheerful giver. And every time that we realize, oh, this is such a great sacrifice, we will thank you and we will praise you and we'll say, what a joy that as I give this up, my, my desire for you is increasing. My dependence upon you is increasing. And with my dependence upon you, you honor those people as we honor you. You're everything to us. We love you. I pray that you would increase our desire for your word, increase our trust in your promises, increase our vision, multiply, Lord. And I pray that eternity will echo with this simple little decision to just say no to a few things, maybe for a few days, so that we can be more and walk with greater authority Father, I pray a blessing on every single person here. I ask that you would endue them with power, strength, and courage to walk according to your perfect will. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.